Hi, I'm Maddie Pioro. I am a rheumatologist at the Cleveland VA and I will be talking today about rheumatoid arthritis and new era. Rheumatoid arthritis is a very important disease for all subspecialists and generalists to know about because it can affect every organ system and we can treat it and there's lots we can do and it is a paradigm disease that illustrates the effects of systemic inflammation. So the talk proceeds. Our actually last grand rounds for this academic year. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Maddie Piero. Dr. Piero obtained her medical degree at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She completed her residency in internal medicine at Montreal General Hospital prior to her fellowship in rheumatology at the Cleveland Clinic. She is currently the section chief of rheumatology at the Lewis Stokes Veterans Affairs Medical Center and the associate fellowship director for rheumatology at University Hospital's Case Medical Center. She is also an assistant professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Piero is deeply committed to medical, medical education at all levels, which is exemplified by her active participation in multiple education committees in both the medical school and the hospital. She also frequently attends on the inpatient general medicine teams of the VA and always receives excellent evaluations. Please join me in welcoming her as she gives her talk on rheumatoid arthritis in a new era. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of slides, but a lot of pictures. I know the pictures help people stay awake, especially while eating. So here we go. So the first picture. So who knows who painted this? Any? Renoir. This is Val Rouda de la Galette. I've got to get the French in there, right? Um, that Renoir painted when he was 35 and still a master of his craft and continued to expand on his craft uh, for the next 30 years. But if one looks at photographs, this is the beginning of photographs, I want you to look at Renoir. And as a rheumatologist, what do I look at? The hands. And what is going on with his hands? Renoir had very advanced rheumatoid arthritis. He developed very advanced rheumatoid arthritis in an era when there was no treatment. And it got so bad that he actually had his paintbrushes strapped to his hands in order to paint. So if you look at his later paintings, they're much more blurry and less fine detail. And there's a reason for that, is that he simply could not handle the brush. And um, he, uh, he suffered from the uh, effects of this disease. And it's something that just gives a different appreciation for his art. So rheumatoid arthritis is a progressive systemic inflammatory disorder of unknown etiology, characterized by symmetric synovitis nearly always involving the hands. If I have a patient who walks into me in my office saying, I have rheumatoid arthritis and their hands and wrists are fine, they don't have rheumatoid arthritis. Or if they do, it's probably a very, very, very mild form that they were very lucky. But if they were treated with significant medications, it's highly unlikely, especially years later, that they actually have rheumatoid arthritis. They probably had rheumatoid arthritis in the blood, which is otherwise known as a positive rheumatoid factor, which we'll talk about. Um, joint erosions are the hallmark of rheumatoid arthritis, and it's very important to realize that uh, rheumatoid has many multi-system extra-articular manifestations from all of it. So it's thought that the incidence is approximately 1% of the adult population. And it is the most common autoimmune arthritis, and it most commonly affects women. Obviously, at the VA, I see predominance of men, but I see women as well, um, without any predominant racial predilection. So I'm going to do a little bit of immunology. I promised the 30,000 foot view, but it's really, really important to get the 30,000 foot view. So if one looks at the immune system as two branches, the adaptive immune system and the innate immune response over here. And really what we're looking at is the adaptive humoral immunity is really um, the chief factor here is the B cell. Remember B cells produce antibodies. And what does the humoral immunity do? It resists invaders acting outside the cells and it prevents viruses from entering cells. On the adaptive immunity side of things, T cells are the major actor here. And T cells resist invaders that reproduce within cells and they destroy cells making mutated forms. And again, the 30,000 foot view is that rheumatoid arthritis is primarily a T cell dysfunction. For those of you who are going to be writing boards, okay? Rheumatoid arthritis, T cell dysfunction. Whereas lupus is primarily a B cell dysfunction. Remember, lupus produces all those antibodies, ANAs, et cetera. So lupus, B cell, rheumatoid arthritis, T cell. But the immune system is not that simple. And there's actually a whole lot of crosstalk. 
And you will see that when we talk about the medications that we use for rheumatoid arthritis, they primarily act on the T cell side of things. Most of them act here, but some of them actually act here. And they act here because this has an effect on the T cells. Okay, so it's important to understand the pathophysiology. Um, when we look at how the T cell interacts with its target cell, it's important to understand what is meant by MHC. MHC stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex Gene. And MHC is a series of genes that code for a genome that could produces the human leukocyte antigen, HLA. So the terms MHC and HLA are almost the same, okay? MHC is the, is the, are the genes that code for the HLA. And the HLA, think of the HLA as the label that the cell wears saying, this is who I am. This is, I, hello, I am a T cell. Hello, I am a natural killer cell. I am whatever, okay? So that's what MHC does. MHC actually kind of identifies who the cell is, and the T cell receptor trolls around and looks for the MHC to figure out what kind of cell this is. And the T cell receptor, then the target cell will present an antigen, which is then recognized by the T cell in the context of the T cell receptor. Okay. And the same DR that we were HLA that we were talking about is the very same HLA that we talk about when we say that a disease is associated with a particular HLA allele. For example, the well-known was of lankylose and cellulitis B27. For board purposes, you must remember the rheumatoid arthritis is D4 and for lupus it's D3. Okay? And what that means is that on that label that the cell recognizes, the immune system, the T cell, is going to very much hone in and recognize the cell bearing the DR. Label. And this HLA-DR4, the significance of this is that it has led to what's called the shared epitope hypothesis, which in a nutshell basically states that that T cell receptor that is identifying the cell of interest is maybe being fooled into thinking that it's seeing a bacteria because there is a homology between some of the amino acids within the HLA-DR that's presented by a rheumatoid T cell and the amino acid sequences that are seen in certain microbes. And this has led to the so-called molecular shared epitope hypothesis, which is, which is part of how we explain why it is thought that certain triggers, for example, infectious agents in genetically susceptible individuals can produce an undesirable immune response with features that could, in the right context, lead to, lead to rheumatoid arthritis. Does that make sense? There are no specific triggers that have been identified, but multiple genetic alleles are known. Okay, that was the immunology. You survived that. So how do we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? We go back to just the basic toolkit, which is history and physical examination. It's as simple as that. And that is the majority of where we get our diagnosis. Physical exam helps, but it all starts with the history. So when I'm looking at, when I have a patient who comes in complaining of pain everywhere, I want to know if they are describing symptoms of inflammation. And the symptoms of inflammation are morning stiffness, more than an hour, and night pain. And morning stiffness means how long does it take for things to loosen up? How long till you get as good as you're going to get in the morning? And that's exactly how I phrase it. I don't ask patients, do you feel stiff? I say, how long does it take in the morning before things loosen up? Can you... Can you make a fist? Can you pour a cup of coffee? Can you tear off a piece of toilet paper? Um, can you do these things? And if the immediate answer is, oh yeah, but it hurts, I'm less, I'm less suspicious than if it's, oh, I have trouble, I have to take two hands, or I have to get my wife to help me, or so forth, okay? And it has to last for a period of time, but then get better. And that is, again, a hallmark of, of, of inflammation, is that the stiffness lasts for a while. It's at its worst in the morning because, of course, you've been immobile all day. If you sit around for a while, for example, a long car ride or watching a movie, you'll stiffen up again. But it'll stiffen and it'll wear off. Whereas patients who have chronic pain, fibromyalgia, they hurt all the time. It's just stiff and hurts all the time. There's no diurnal variation. It's just the same morning and evening, and yet they can still use their hands. Okay? So morning stiffness is a key component of inflammation. Night pain, which is pain that wakes one from sleep, is also a key symptom of inflammation. It is not exclusive to inflammation. Infection can do it, malignancy can do it, but the time frame will help you sort it out, okay? If you had night pain for two years, it's doubtful that you're hiding a cancer. Some other symptoms should have been showing up by now, okay? Um, the classic signs of inflammation have been known since the Greeks, and that's what we look for in rheumatoid arthritis. What we're looking is not so much redness or warmth, 
as a rheumatologist, if I see redness or warmth in a joint, I'm thinking of something that irritates the heck out of the joint. And that's basically infection or crystals, okay? I do not see typically redness or warmth in rheumatoid arthritis or any of the other chronic arthritis for that matter. But I will see pain, swelling, and loss of function. And one learns to recognize a pattern of involvement of joints in rheumatoid arthritis. Whereas osteoarthritis affects primarily the small joints, if you think of your grandma with knobby fingers, it's going to be the DIPs and PIPs, right? Rheumatoid hits closer to home. Rheumatoid affects the PIPs, MCPs, and wrists. So if you are 75 years old and your wrists hurt, that is not normal. It's not just because you're old. Now, if you fractured it or you fell off the bike when you were eight years old and now you're 75 and your wrist hurts, that's okay. I buy that. But if it just happened out of the blue, that's not normal. Something is going on. And eventually, the features become very obvious. And by the time it's this obvious, that's because there have been erosion. There has been damage to the joints. And we'll talk about that. So if we look at a cross-section of the joint, normally the joint is lined by a very thin synovial membrane that lines the joint itself as well as the synovial capsule. And that synovial membrane normally is extremely thin. It's very similar to... You know when you hard boil an egg and you peel the egg and you get that very thin membrane? That's how thin that synovial membrane should be. Very, very thin. All it does is just line the joint and contain the fluid. With rheumatoid arthritis, that is the primary target. And that synovial membrane becomes inflamed and thickened and starts actually penetrating within bone. And starts, you can see it, this is cross-section, this is normal, it gets thickened, even more thickened, and this is what is called the panis. The panis is like an in situ proliferation, almost like a cancer in situ, except it will metastasize. But it will actually grind into bone. This is panis penetrating within cartilage and bone. This is MRI view of the, of the panis penetrating within bone. This is a gross specimen, more gross specimen. All of this here, this is those shiny white stuff is what it's supposed to look like. All of this pink stuff is the panis that has invaded into the cartilage and bone and destroyed the bone. And it's actually penetrating in and the end result is that instead of a normal hand x-ray like this, and I want you to pay attention to the wrists and the MCPs. Remember that's what we're looking at for really for our these are the areas that will be completely affected by rheumatoid arthritis. So look at that. No more cartilage. Completely gone. Completely gone. A normal hand x-ray, I should be able to see all these little individual bones, okay? Or at least just, you know, delineate them fairly well. It's like a little archipelago, and I could, should be able to take a little kayak and go sailing between the bones here. You can't go sailing between the bones. Something is wrong. Something has happened to that wrist. And this wrist can only move like so. It can't move all the way up. It's very limited in its range of motion. And the same for the MCPs. And unfortunately, once erosions happen, you cannot undo them. You cannot turn back the clock. And it doesn't take long. In active rheumatoid arthritis, erosions occur within, within two years of onset in 70% of patients. And how often do patients come and just stall? Oh, I'm getting older. Oh, I'll try Motrin. Oh, I'll try this. Very often we see them. They've already had, you know, a year and a half, two years worth. So one of the take-home messages, if you remember nothing else from this lecture, is that if you ever get an x-ray report of hands or feet, or any other joint for that matter, and the radiologist puts the word erosion, please consult rheumatology, okay? It's not normal to have an erosion in a bone. Something's wrong. Could be gout, could be rheumatoid, but it shouldn't be there, all right? And by the way, we can actually also see erosion very well in the pre-radiographic stage by MRI and by ultrasound, where the thin line shows erosions and the thicker lines actually show cinnamitis. And that's kind of become a whole new area of research in rheumatology is can we detect patients pre-radiographically? Because ideally, that's what we want to do. The sooner, the better. And it's very important to realize that there's a dissociation between the visible damage that the patient, uh, that, that you can see on exam, and the underlying damage. So it takes a lot of damage before you start seeing changes. So you have to be suspicious of it and think of it. And what that means is, again, if you have a patient who's complaining of hand or wrist pain and there's stiffness in the morning, please don't hesitate to send this patient to rheumatology, okay? Because we can help them, but we've got to get our hands on them early, before the erosions occur. This is one of my patients at the VA. This is a 68-year-old male who turned out to have seropositive rheumatoid. 
very afraid of medications. Does he already have rheumatoid? Yes, look at that hand. Clearly he has changes in his MCPs, and it's starting over here. That one's not normal. That's normal, that's not normal. He's starting to, this is more polyosteoarthritis. These bones look pretty good. These bones don't look too bad. It's starting to narrow a little. See, I can navigate through the, through the wrist bones pretty well. But he was very afraid of medications and only allowed me to put him on a baby, baby dose, a whiff of methotrexate, five milligrams, where the standard dose is more like 20. This is him, six years later. Six years. All day, fatigue, no clear synovitis on exam. But, and this is one of these patients who actually had not much pain. And so the hardest patients sometimes are the ones who have no pain because they feel like there's no big deal. And at the same time, their joints are gradually getting worse. Okay. All right. So how do we actually determine if a patient is active? So we have all kinds of measures of disease activity. And the two key ones are the ACR score, which stands for the American College of Rheumatology, which basically represents a, it's a composite score that essentially gives a, an idea of whether the patient is 20%, 50%, or 70% better from one visit to the next based on the number of tender and swollen joints, specific joints, as well as based on patient self-assessment on a visual analog scale, 0 to 10, the physician global, same thing, pain, same thing. Disability, we have one page questionnaires for that, and an acute phase reactant, which can either be the SED rate or the CRP. And so a composite score of all of this will give us a overall number by which we can judge whether or not the patient is getting better, or getting worse, or staying the same. In Europe, a similar scoring system is used, which is called the DAS28, which sounds German, but actually stands for Disease Activity Score. Um, and it looks at these 28 joints. And notice how the preponderance of upper extremity. We've only got the knees here. Rheumatoid is primarily an upper extremity problem, at least when it starts, OK? Um, and the same thing, you calculate the visual analog scale, tender joint count, swollen joint count, sed rate, and then you crunch it through this mega equation here that includes a natural log of the sed rate plus 0.014 times the visual analog score, and then up pops a number, and based on that, you can determine a final composite score. And this sounds like a lot, but it's very important because we really, as you'll see later, Part of the improvement we've had in treating these patients has come from simply measuring them and determining are they getting any better or are they getting worse. Now, a word about rheumatoid factor, because I can't talk about rheumatoid thrice and not talk about rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is a misnomer, okay? I get at least three consults a week at the VA for, rheumato for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis based on blood test. And blood tests and arthralgias, and that means positive rheumatoid factor and I hurt. That does not equal rheumatoid arthritis. At the VA, that actually equals hepatitis, okay? Because one of the most common causes of a false positive rheumatoid factor is hepatitis. So if you have a patient with a, pos with a positive rheumatoid factor, lesson number two, get a hepatitis screening panel, okay? Get a hepatitis screening panel on those patients with positive rheumatoid factor because it is very much a cause of false positive, as are all of these other conditions. So just because somebody has a positive rheumatoid factor does not mean they have rheumatoid arthritis. It remains a clinical diagnosis. The better test nowadays is actually anti-CCP, which stands for cyclic citrullinated peptide. And that has a better sensitivity and specificity, although still not perfect. But certainly, it's a great test to use, for example, in a hepatitis patient who has a positive rheumatoid factor and who has joint pains and you know questionable exam. That would be the perfect test. The importance of both of these antibodies is that they do identify a subtype, subset of patients that tend to do worse. So if I have a patient who has kind of very early, is really kind of questioning whether they should be on medication, if they have a positive rheumatoid factor and or CCP, I'm really going to be pushing them hard to go on something stronger, okay? Because these are the patients who will get the extra articular manifestation. And what are the extra articular manifestations? Stations. Well, they're all over the place. The eyes. Every rheumatoid arthritis, less than three, every rheumatoid arthritis patient needs an eye exam once a year for the rest of their life, till the day they die. Okay? Even if they're on three medications with names you want. 
okay? Because even if their rheumatoid arthritis is well controlled peripherally, remember that the eyes have the blood-brain barrier. And whatever you're giving to them peripherally may not be making it through the blood-brain barrier and into the eye. So they very often patients with eye inflammation have completely silent joints, okay? But they have to get an eye exam. And I would even expand this to say that any patient who has a rheumatologic diagnosis that ends in itis needs an eye exam once a year, okay? Basically, all right? Um, what else? The, uh, the other big one is the lung involvement, okay? Patients with rheumatoid arthritis have a very high likelihood of developing some degree of lung disease. And very often these are patients who don't move much and don't exert themselves much. And so these are patients who will not necessarily bring out the shortness of breath. Or people say, oh yeah, they're deconditioned, that's why they're short of breath. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's a very important thing to, to recognize. All right. Here's another patient, 52-year-old female. I was able to convince her to start again on low to medium dose methotrexate, but she really didn't like and hydroxychloroquine. But a year later, she stopped because she didn't like pills and, and just couldn't be bothered. And this is her, five years later. Often affects the dominant hand more. This is actually what stopped her. She was a bus, school bus driver. This became an issue for driving the bus. Now, of concern is this, but of more concern, and you can't really see it, is, is her lungs, it's better on my picture, but she basically has completely fibro fibrotic interstitial lung disease. She is on oxygen and she has horrible lungs. And that has happened insidiously over the course of the same time frame. This is what's gonna kill her. So, very important to understand that these patients have systemic inflammation. They are just one big bundle of inflammation from head to toe, okay? And as part of this, inflammation leads to accelerated atherosclerosis. And I'm very used to half my residents rotating in clinic with me heading for cardiology. So this is what I make sure to tell them, is that rheumatoid arthritis is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease that is as strong as diabetes. They have this chronic inflammation that is basically just predisposing their body to put, to place cholesterol, to atherosclerose their vessels, and puts them at significantly higher risk for cardiovascular disease, even taking into account all the underlying risk factors of obesity, of steroid use, of deconditioning, etc. In the rheumatology world, we have known this now for 10 years. It's boring now. Nobody even writes anymore in the rheumatology world about how much increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases in rheumatoid patients because we all know it. But it hasn't trickled enough outside the rheumatology world. So you should think of rheumatoid arthritis patients in the same way as you do diabetes. So as, it, as an example, one prospective cohort in the Netherlands 353 patients with RA. Now, 353 may not seem much for those cardiolog future cardiologists in the room, but for a rheumatologist, that's an amazing number, okay? It's hard to round up 353 patients with documented rheumatoid. And if one looks at these patients, and these are very well characterized patients, the Netherlands are way up there, and they're kind of leaders in the field of rheumato rheumatology. And if we look at the hazard ratio that these patients have, it's exactly comparable to diabetic patients in terms of cardiovascular disease after adjusting for everything. So these patients need to be on statins, they need blood pressure control in the same ballpark as rheumatoid patients, and they definitely, definitely need to stop smoking. Smoking actually makes rheumatoid arthritis worse, and this, the anticyclic citrullinated peptides, those CCP, uh, antibodies have receptors in the lungs, and that is thought to be part of the mechanism whereby smoking actually makes rheumatoid arthritis worse. It's thought to activate some of those TCP receptors in the lung. So even more reason to stop smoking. So if we think about the inflammatory spectrum, what we're looking at is our patients who early on have inflammation, and later the inflammation progresses, 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 and develops damage and scarring. And eventually that results in erosions and fibrosis. And although I write that the arrow is two-sided, yes, we think somewhere in this range it's two-sided, but once you get to here, it's no longer two-sided. It stays here. So the challenge, of course, is to either identify patients very early on here and to treat them when they're here, but not wait until they get to here. Because once they get to here, you can't really turn the clock back. And how do you do that? Well, early on, you treat with anti-inflammatories. 
and I'm not talking NSAIDs, I'm talking anti-inflammatories. Strong anti-inflammatories that act by suppressing the immune system to really go where the problem is. And those are primarily nowadays DMARD, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which we'll talk about, things like methotrexate and TNF inhibitors, like adalimumab and abitonership. By the time you get to here, you know, you're going to be dealing with analgesics and joint replacements and maybe some adjunct adju adju therapy, uh, like, not, like neuropathic agents and so forth. But there really isn't much you can do to turn back the clock here. So what we are doing in rheumatology is trying to get patients with these medications sooner and sooner and sooner. Because time is bone. Remember, time is heart and time is brain. Well, time is bone too, OK? The sooner we get it in, the better. And so the components of rheumatoid arthritis pharmaceutical ma management, if the patient's symptoms are primarily morning stiffness, swelling, effusion, they are on the inflammatory side of the spectrum. And you're going to be treating them with NSAIDs and glucocorticoids, sure, with appropriate caution to the glucocorticoid side effects. If they're on the far end and they're mechanical, bone on bone pain and malalignment, you're doing an allergenic neuropathic agent. But if they're somewhere in that mid-range, whether far to the left or closer to the right, we want to prevent further damage from active disease, and that is where the medications come in. And that is where education of the patient is so important, because just like the patients I showed you who are afraid of the medications, they should also be afraid of the effects of the rheumatoid arthritis. And so what are the medications? There are non-targeted traditional small molecules that traditionally have been called DMARDs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and that includes things like hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, reflunamide, targeted biologics, which include the TNF inhibitor, and we'll talk about more. And the latest and newest hot off the presses in the last year are the targeted small molecules. So the old treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, even before my times, was you don't do anything until you prove that this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. And the only way you could prove that this patient has rheumatoid arthritis is wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until the hands are like this, and then you get x-rays and you see erosion, and you go, aha, certified, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Well, it's a little late. It's kind of like waiting to diagnose Alzheimer's till you get the biopsy proving that there's Alzheimer's, OK? Um, and then you would start the, D the DMARDs and then these experimental treatments. And then in the 1980s, D, uh, DMARDs, in particular methotrexate, came into being and really revolutionized treatment. And later, the TNF inhibitors came on board, and these have become the standard of care. So now we diagnose with or without erosions. In fact, we would much prefer to diagnose without, because that means that it, we've, we still have salvageable, uh, salvageable joint. Okay. So treatment now is hit hard. So we are doing like the oncologists. We are doing an induction remission type of model. At least that's the plan. If we can get patients soon enough, that's what we do. And the sooner we get them, the more we are going to try to treat them fairly aggressively. Now mind you, fairly aggressively, by, by oncology standards, the methotrexate use, doses that we use are piddly, they're laughable, okay? And sometimes I say that in those very words to patients who are afraid that they're getting chemotherapy, okay? It's, education is really very important. I have patients with methotrexate, who've been on methotrexate for literally 50 years that I'm following, okay? And certainly, if I had rheumatoid arthritis, I would not hesitate to get, go on methotrexate. And I say that to patients. I have seen enough of it, I am a believer. Okay. Um, the same approach is, and combinations of DMARDs and biologics. The same approach, by the way, is used for other non-RA chronic inflammatory arthropathies like psoriatic arthritis and so forth, and other systemic inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, which is treated with the very same type of agents. So one of the standard disease-modifying agents, they're the ones that you see here. I just put these for historical context. Nobody else uses gold or penicillamine anymore, although I did about nine years ago, I have a patient present to VA asking for a gold pill. And I actually went to the VA pharmacy and said, do we have gold pills? And they hunted high and low, and it turned out that there was still one factory in the US that made gold pills somehow. But they were astronomically expensive because they are a third gold by weight, these pills. <laughs> and since our medications are, since A, they have side effects, and B, we have actually much better medications, so the VA pharmacist respectfully declined, and I told the patient, you know, we have these newer medications now that we probably should try. Um, and the one medication that you want to remember is methotrexate, okay? 
Um, and these medications can be used in combination. And what we do when we use them in combination, that the Trixit gets a yellow because it's our favorite pill, okay, and it's yellow. Um, what we do is, we, if we're going to use them, we try, it's like oncology, we try to use medications that don't have overlapping toxicity. So if you have one medication with bone marrow toxicity, you're going to try to use another medication that doesn't or that has relatively less. You try not to use two medications with liver toxicity, okay? Um, and synovitis definitely decreases before and after DMARD therapy. And although these are older medications, they're still very good medications. And in fact, methotrexate is so entrenched and has proven itself time and time again so much. Methotrexate alone is sufficient in about 30% of patients. 30% of patients do not need to progress to the heavy duty, to the, to the uh, TNF inhibitors. And all rheumatoid arthritis trials that have been going on for the last 15 years use methotrexate as the comparator. There is no such thing as a placebo-controlled rheumatoid arthritis trial. It is always a methotrexate that is used as placebo because it is considered unethical to not give patients methotrexate. That's how entrenched it is and that's how well it works. So what are the pros? They slow down definitely. The whole point of these medications is to slow down the development of erosions. So the same development of erosions that would occur over two years, you can now spread that out over 12 years. Okay, or maybe over 20 years. And that's very important because these, this disease hits people in the prime of their working lives. And if you can delay significant damage by 20 years, that's huge. That makes all the difference between somebody being disabled and being able to work and somebody not. They act as steroid sparing agents. This is a very big uh, aspect of this DMARDS. And we actually follow patients in rheumatology clinic who have not rheumatoid arthritis, but some weird other disease, particular ocular diseases or germ diseases that are steroid responsive and that the minute you drop the steroid, the disease comes back and you want something to bring down the dose of, the dose of uh, steroids and that's what the DMARDs can be used for as well. You're trading one set of evils for another set of evils, but certainly I would prefer being long-term on methotrexate or sulfasalazine than I would be long-term on 15 milligrams of prednisone, that's for sure. Okay. What are the, the toxicity? We kind of alluded to that on previous slide. Of course, they increase infection, but this can be managed by just using common sense. Some patients are more complicated than others, of course. And there has always been a question about oncogenicity with all immunosuppressants. In other words, do immunosuppressants increase risk of cancer down the road? And the answer is possibly. Um, and the reason we say this is that and this is how I explain it to patients. We know that if we suppress your immune system very profoundly for a long period of time, you will probably develop a slightly increased risk of cancer because your immune system and my immune system is constantly fighting off cancer cells. We all need cancer cells every minute of every day, but our immune system is very good at finding those cells, honing in on them, and destroying. If you suppress the immune system, suppress, suppress, suppress for a long period of time, chances are one of those cells is going to make it through and is going to start proliferating and you will develop cancer. So being on these medications can increase risk of cancer. When do we see that? Well, based on the transplant literature, which admittedly is comparing apples to oranges because these are patients who are much more heavily immunosuppressed than our patients and they're immunosuppressed with different cocktails of medications. But in the transplant literature, patients who get uh, malignancies get them at about the 12, 13, 14, kind of the teen years out from their from their um, from their transplant and what we have seen is that with methotrexate we've been using that for 40 years and we haven't seen an increased rate a lot of our newer medications are getting into that dog pot 14 15 years and so far knock on wood we haven't seen any any uh, major issues come up. There's always a little smoke. Is the fire not clear? Most of the data comes from the European uh, groups, which have very huge databases and are tracking everybody because it's socialized medicine and it's all linked in with their national death index and it's a great source of data. Okay. Um, that being that being said, always something to consider and something to discuss with patients. So going back to the 30,000 foot view. The DMARDs that I just spoke about, the methotrexate, the flunomide, et cetera, they act kind of all over here, okay? This is not working. They act over the whole thing. Um, where the biologics are targeted, they act on very specific parts of the immune system. So let's talk about some of these biologics, okay? And they're called biologics because they're very difficult 
which medications to make, the TNF inhibitors, which is what I'm going to talk about first, and then others. They have to actually be produced by bacteria. You have to insert the proper um, genome into the bacteria, and they have to spew out these medications. And the bacteria have to be kept warm and happy in these giant vats of broth, and uh, have to be subjected to just the right conditions that will keep them happy. And it's very labor intensive and very expensive. And the drug companies certainly pass those costs along, which I will describe. So if we look at a kind of a slightly more uh, detailed view of the inflammatory cascade, we've got the antigen presenting cell that connects with the T cell. T cells get activated. There's some recruitment of B cells that occurs. The activated T cells then can activate B cells further or can activate macrophages. And all of this starts triggering this whole release of cytokines. And all these arrows that I just pointed out here are different, different places where our biologics work. So it's a very specific pathway, as opposed to the DMARDs, where it's just kind of multiple effects all over. These have very specific pathways, they're targeted. And they act at different levels, and they have different effects. So let's talk about TNF inhibitors. TNF inhibitors have become the standard of care for rheumatoid arthritis. I take that back. Methotrexate remains the standard of care, but TNF inhibitors, if the methotrexate alone does not do the job, is added on top. And TNF stands for tumor necrosis factor because when these, when this, uh, these cytokines were first found, they actually cause a, for a line of mouse sarcoma cells to die in vitro, and that is where the term TNF comes from. But these are cytokines that are pro-inflammatory that have multiple effects. You can't see this, but basically just understand it has effects all over the body on multiple organ systems. The one that, that interests us and upon which works, the, the mechanism which works in our diseases, is this one, the effect of TNF on the effector T cell. And the TNF basically is one of the top cytokines in the inflammatory cascade. Once TNF gets revved up, then this whole inflammatory cascade spills over and the horse is out of the barn. So if you can stop the TNF in early on, you can interrupt the cascade that then precipitates inflammation. And there are a number of different TNF inhibitors and they are all given parenterally. They all have different names. Anything that ends in AB is an antibody. Anything that ends in EPT is a receptor inhibitor. Anything that's got an X in it is chimeric. In other words, has a part mouse, part human. So here in Fliximab, there's the part mouse, part human, all human with a little mouse here, right? Um, and one can change from one TNF inhibitor to another with inadequate response, okay? By the way, anything that ad ends in AB, EPT, or IB also costs a lot of money. <laughs> so TNF inhibitors, if we look at what they do, all these are graphs that basically say the same thing, which is that if we look, remember an ACR20 basically means your patient got 20% better. ACR50 means your patient got 50% better. ACR70, your patient got 70% better. These are pretty darn good numbers. How would you like to have a medication in your particular field that got 40% of patients halfway better and 20%, 70% better? That's pretty darn good. If you, if you look at the absolute value of what statins do or other medications, they're not, nowhere near that kind of number. Now the question is though, does it last and at what price? Okay. So we definitely see sustained improvement in the majority of patients. Remember, all these patients are also using methotrexate as a baseline because it's not ethical to not give it to them. And this is where the rubber meets the road. We actually see these are ways to measure, to actually grade erosions on x-ray. And what do we see? We see fewer erosions over time. So it's actually doing what we want it to do, which is to decrease the damage and improve the functional status. So what are the pros? Well, they work, they decrease erosions, you can use them even with bad liver, bad kidneys, they don't have too, too much in terms of cytopenia, but they increase risk of infection. And there's another take home message, TB, okay? If you, here's my next slide, PPD and chest x-ray before any TNF inhibitor, okay? Very important, remember that one too. So, increased risk of infection. I cannot even order a TNF inhibitor without having a documented PPD and chest x-ray in the computer, and that is as it should be, okay? Because what do TNF inhibitors do? TNF inhibitors melt granulomas. I have a few patients that I follow who have sarcoidosis that I'm giving TNF inhibitors to, and it works great. It melts the granuloma. Now, if that granuloma happens to have 
little tuberculous bacilli in it and you melt the granuloma and the bacilli go, wee, that's not so good. Okay, so you gotta look for it and treat it. All right, also can increase demyelinating disease. In the early stages of treatment of TNF inhibitors, it turns out that a mouse model of MS worked great. TNF inhibitors worked great. The mice did better. This was experimental allergic encephalitis, so they proceeded to MS, MS trials. It was a catastrophe. It made MS worse. So if you have MS, you can't do this, okay? Also, congestive heart failures, class four or greater. Again, in the early stages, before even development of rheumatoid arthritis, patients in the ICU all have dramatically high levels of TNF because they've got all this inflammation and, and sepsis going on. And likewise, patients with CHF have great, very elevated levels of, of um, TNF. So the tri there was actually a small, but it fairly quickly ended trial for TNF inhibitors in CHF, and it made patients worse. So if you have a patient with stage four CHF, they should not be on a TNF inhibitor. My quick and dirty screen is if they're not on a diuretic, they're good to go, okay? If they are on a diuretic, then ACR actually recommends that if you have an ejection fraction of less than 40%, you should not be on a TNF inhibitor. However, I have patients with injection fractions of 35%, and then what do I do? I put my internist hat on and I evaluate to see if they have CHF. This is something I know everybody in the audience is very accustomed to doing. So if you think that their CHF is well controlled, then you kind of start them, you tippy toe them, you do maybe every two weeks instead of every week. You check them and look for shortness of breath, and in six months you might get a repeat echo, okay? Because the patient may, be have, may have CHF, but at the same time the patient is like this and can't move. So it's a balance between quality of life and treating the heart, okay? And there is a possible loss of efficacy long term. And what we've seen clinically is that patients kind of when they hit the two year mark, they either sail through or often it loses effectiveness. And the two year mark happens to be just around the time that patients, that some patients will mount antibodies to the antibodies. Okay, remember these are antibodies that are not normal. Okay, um, so it's possible that that may be what represents. And minor issue of cost, which we will talk about. And here's the cost. This is blurry, but this is, these are the latest costs that I didn't update this, but this is 2011. Take a look at the yearly cost for these medications, okay? These are not cheap medications. They're very expensive, and when we look at, when I know at the VA, um, when we look at the top 10 most expensive meds, well, the one that has vaulted to the top, you know what that is, hepatitis C, of course. That one is, Miles above the others, that, but, that okay, okay, <laughs> um, but right up there in the top 10 are etanercept, datalimumab, and fliximab, okay, so we are spending a lot of money, and these are patients, these, these patients need it lifelong. Okay, PBD chest x-ray. Now, let's talk briefly about cytokines. Cytokines are mediators of inflammation. Save the slide and look at it before boards so you can cram the which, which cytokines are prone and which are anti-inflammatory. And basically, it should be a balance. Homeostasis implies that there's a balance between pro and, and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So what do our medications do? Well, they attack the pro-inflammatory cytokines, including TNF-alpha. And so this is where we actually get into different medications. Um, CTLA-4, herbaticept, is another medication that works by a different mechanism. And what it does is it basically acts on a second signal. So when the antigen-presenting cell binds with the T cell, I just said it binds, but of course it's more simple than that. It binds, but then there's a second signal. It's like there's a handshake, but then there has to be a secret handshake. So it blocks the secret handshake, and that stops the inflammation. And, and the end result is that it actually helps with rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Slower onset, but has similar effectiveness to the TNF inhibitors. Other biologic agents, if we block IL-1, otherwise known as anakinra, not as effective, has had a dramatic response, a dramatic effectiveness in some of those weird childhood auto-inflammatory diseases where the children are born with diseases with acronyms year long that basically look like congenital graft versus host disease and their skin is a mess and they've got inflammation everywhere and their eyes are inflamed and they get given this and they just, it's a Lazarus effect, they return from the dead. Of course it costs an arm and leg and that's the difficult part. IL-6 receptor antagonist, tocilizumab, same thing, um, similar effectiveness. So basically we're learning through trial and error, picking and choosing the different parts of the inflammatory cascade. 
Now, it's, when I say they work just as well, we have to be cautious. There are, and there never will be, head-to-head -head trials of different medications because the pharmaceutical companies will not put their medication head-to-head -head with another medication. But we extrapolate by looking at the ACR 2050-70 rates from different medications and comparing. And this is what we do, even though it's not what we should be doing, but in practice, that's what we do. And the same is true in other, uh, in other specialties, I know. Now, one to really know about is rituximab. Remember when I told you that all of these medications I taught you about up until now, they're all T cell. They're all acting on the T cell side of the immune system. Rituximab acts on the B cell, okay? Remember how I told you that early on, up in the beginning, the T cells and B cells have to get together and, and coordinate efforts? That's where the rituximab is working. So rituximab was originally used, and is still very much used, as a designer drug for long Hodgkin's lymphoma. Any chemo regimen you have that has an R in it, that's rituximab. R chop, rituximab, okay? So what it does is it depletes all but the youngest and oldest B cells. So this is your pre-pre B cell, and this is your mature plasma cell. It will deplete all cells that express CD20 as a cell, a cell surface marker, which is basically everybody except these guys and these guys. So it leaves the toddlers and the mature cells. Wipes out every B cell in between. And so we still have cells making antibodies, and we still have very early cells, but we don't have all the cells in between. And amazingly, they don't have too, too many infections. That being said, there are a few infections one must, 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 must think of in the toxinab. And before you ever, ever think of putting a patient on your toxinab, you have to screen for what? TB is more TNF. Hepatitis, Hep B. You can kill patients if you give them rituximab and, you ha and they have underlying Hep B. And the screening of Hep B is not a simple matter. Just because things are negative or appear negative does not mean they are negative. So, you know, consult your friendly hepatologist or ID doctor. Um, so. So really, this was found basically by serendipity, that patients who were getting rituximab for lymphoma, lo and behold, their rheumatoid arthritis got better. And then we kind of went, oh, wait, this isn't supposed to be working because it's not working on the T cell side of things, but guess what, it actually is. Okay. So all these graphs basically say that you get good results clinically and radiographically with many of these different medications I talked to you about. The, the foundation remains methotrexate, followed by TNF inhibitors, but if TNF inhibitors don't work or are contraindicated, we actually have a lot of options. We are really in a golden era of rheumatology at, the, at this time. Um, now, the latest and newest are the targeted small molecules, and these have just come out in the last year, okay? And the classic, the targeted molecule I'm going to talk to you about is something called tofacidinib, okay? But the, the development of these targeted small molecules, the impetus here is that because they're small, they can be given as a pill, okay? So every, all those other ones were parenteral. These are given as a pill. That's a big plus. Um, needle phobia is a very real issue. And they are more stable. They don't need to be refrigerated. They're easier to get to in people who live in rural areas. All my other ones have to be refrigerated and you know, kind of kept very, in very specific conditions. Um, and uh, what they're doing is they're actually targeting intracellular pathways as opposed to extracellular pathways. And this was driven by the success of tyrosine kinases in cancer therapy, such as demanded for CML. Um, what also happens though with these medications is that because they aren't quite as focused as all those antibodies I was telling you about, they can actually have effects outside of what you were hoping that they were going to have effects on. And that's something that you only find out by giving to patients, right? So they can have off-target effects, and the question is, are those off-target effects something to be concerned about? So tofacitinib, um, other, uh, Zelgens is the name. I didn't come up with these names. Okay. Is a genus kinase inhibitor, which is one of the kinases. And genus was the Roman god, okay, the Roman god of, who could see the past and the future at once. And because he could see in two directions, he was also the god of doorways and departures. And the genus kinase spans the cell membrane and kind of opens up the cell membrane. So it's a genus kinase. Um, and uh, 
inhibitor. And the tofacitinib, it turns out, was designed um, to compete head-to-head -head with TNF inhibitors, and it actually works just as well. Now, it's hard to find patients nowadays for trials who haven't actually been on TNF inhibitors, so it took a while to gather those data, but it seems to work just as well. The, the effectiveness is similar. Now, you would think that since these medications are basically a string of amino acids, they should be cheap. You think they're cheap? No. The pills are the equivalent to what the IV medications are. So these are unbelievably expensive, at least as of now. Among kind of those spillover effects we talked about, preliminary uh, studies suggest that there's an increased risk of shingles. So there's another infectious thing to think about. And because of that, I was doing it before, but I now do this routinely. Any patient that I start, that I'm going to consider starting on, on, on uh, immunosuppression, I make sure that they are up to speed on their hepat they, that they've been screened for hepatitis, that they are up to speed on their Pneumovax, up to speed on their flu shot, and I give them shingles vaccine before starting biologics, okay? So you can give shingles vaccine to patients who are on the old DMARDs, and even prednisone as long as it's less than 20 milligrams, which hopefully most patients are on less than 20. But once they're on an AB and EPT or an IB, you can't give them the shingles vaccine. In practice, you can. Okay? In practice, many people have, and knock on wood, have done okay. I've even had a couple of my patients who inadvertently got it because it didn't show up on their med list, and I kind of followed them carefully, and they did just fine. Um, so it probably is okay, but it's really not recommended, and it's not something I do. You want to stop the, uh, the ab, ib, or ept for a good four weeks before, start, before giving the shingles vaccine. At least two weeks before, two weeks after. At least a total of four weeks. Okay? And during that time, of course, they're going to flare, so they're not going to be happy. Um, and here's another interesting side effect of tofacitinib that was completely a serendipitous. It was given to a patient who had alopecia universalis, which is an autoimmune condition with hair loss. And look what happened to this patient. Completely grew back the hair. This patient actually had a psoriasis as well in his scalp. So it's now being, being studied for, psori for psoriasis. Alas, this is not a treatment for male pattern baldness. Otherwise, this would be a really hot item. Okay? Um, but it is actually undergoing formal trials for this very reason. Because look at this. I mean, isn't that impressive? That's really impressive. Okay, so these are some of these kind of spillover effects that you don't know till you try. That's a good one, but what about the bad ones? Okay, this medication increases, lipid pro increases lipids in a bad way. That's not so good. We don't want to see that, especially since our patients are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease to begin with. So, current and future directions. It is very clear that early intervention yields better results. And so we have actually the, the two main uh, rheumatology organizations, the ACR in the US and the UR in Europe, have put their heads together and come up with a standardized early identification, which can recognize patients as early as six weeks. That's fabulous. It's also very hard. That's the far, far left end of the spectrum. Okay. So in the Netherlands, there are apparently posters, like billboards in the street saying, do you think you have rheumatoid Come on over to our clinic. Okay. Um, and there have now been studies, this is very important and very, very encouraging because studies that have looked at giving these treatments to patients very early on who have less than six months of rheumatoid arthritis, and sometimes even less than three months, suggest that the induction remission really works, that you can hit them really hard and then treat them for a while and then withdraw everything. And that a subset of them are, we won't say the word cured, but are disease free. And we don't have the five year data yet. But there is hope that if we act early enough in patients, there's a subset of patients that we can actually completely put into remission. We've also worked on standardizing disease activity measures. The key term, the, the buzzword in rheumatology is treat to target. Just as in, in blood pressure control and diabetes, you want to treat to a target. The target is going to be one of those various, one of those various disease measures of activity that we talked about and, we, and they're being standardized. And these are the type of studies that have been done where there's a regular care arm and the treat to target where they're seen every single month and every single month they get the whole joint count and everything and if they haven't met a certain target, the, the medications get cranked up. 
And what has been shown, and these are six different regimens of medications that were done in the Netherlands. Remember, they're the, they're the happening place. And what was basically shown is that no matter what combination of medications you used, the patients did better if you controlled their disease aggressively early on. So it doesn't even seem to really matter what you use as much as the fact that you're using it aggressively and early. That's the key, early and aggressive, okay? And so current, nowadays we are talking about our treatment goal in early RA being remission and maybe even cure, but we don't say that yet. Um, and establish rheumatoid arthritis low disease activity because these patients are going to be much harder to tell. And it can be very challenging to tell if a patient who has some chronic changes if it's, and who is on medication, whether their pain represents to some degree of smoldering activity versus just kind of chronic, just chronic mechanical changes. This is a graph that I will bore you with, but that kind of summarizes how different types of medications for rheumatoid, and these are the mechanisms of the medications, and these are the disease activity, how they've worked. And green is good, and yellow is not so good, and red is no good, and gray is no data. Notice that all the patients with green who did really well are patients who were, first of all, who were on, um, who had not that, that impressive of a joint, the ball was set pretty low here, ACR 20, and they were the patients who had never been on methotrexate and had never been on TNF inhibitor. The patients who had been on methotrexate were tougher nuts to crack, and the patients who had been and failed TNF inhibitors were even more tough nuts to crack. It makes sense, you know, the patients who have tried this, tried that, tried that, tried that, and failed are going to be the harder patients to treat. Finally, the small molecules and drugs, there's those big vets I was talking about where the biologics are manufactured, okay? And um, in theory, the small molecules, including the new sexy new small molecules, should be cheap because it's a string of amino acids. That has not translated as of yet into uh, less cost. We shall see. I'm not holding my breath. But what else is new and hot? Biosimilars. So if we're, since these biologic costs so much, can we do a generic version of, bio, of biologics? And this is extremely hot. The first ever biosimilar was approved in the US in January, and that is a biosimilar for Nupogen, Zarxio, I guess. And this is where the money is. This is where pharmaceutical companies are putting all their budget. This in cancer drugs. Okay. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, and this is from an article in Forbes, okay, from May 12th. This is off the presses. The industry says that by 2016, 10 of the top 20 best-selling drugs will be biologics. And when you see the cost, it's not surprising. And other countries have raced forward with this. And the cost difference seems to be about 30% less, which given that these patients are on these medications lifelong, is a substantial improvement. So this is simply a timeline of where we started and where we're at now, and we're seeing a ton of development of new medications for rheumatoid arthritis. And what has this translated to? This has actually translated, we're now getting data. These show surgeries over a span of time of 30 years. In the UK, they can do these studies, and what has been shown is there are measurable declines in the rate of joint replacements for small and medium joints, which are hands and feet and wrists and ankles. Hasn't changed for hip and knee, which is still OA. And we're starting to see some decrease in cardiovascular fatality in patients who are aggressively treated with these medications because we're acting on the inflammation. So what is the future? Well, number one, probably more important than anything else is compliance. Because what I haven't mentioned is that in spite of how wonderful these medications are, patients stop taking them or forget to take them. And you can put all the money you want into developing new medications. You would do better having patients just comply a little better with the medications that they're supposed to be taking. Easier said than done. Treatment protocols, are there different combinations? Are there different sequences? There are many studies actually coming out now from Europe primarily that have actually formally looked at decreasing the medication. So if our typical infliximab is every eight weeks, well, what about every 12 weeks? Or if we give adalimumab every, every week, how about every two weeks? And it turns out that that seems to work. Stopping the medication altogether, unfortunately, results in rebound flares. But stretching it out once a patient has been quiescent seems to, knock on wood, work, at least for a subset of patients. Do we have a cure? Not yet. So 
I guess I'm a card-carrying member of the American College of Rheumatology. Rheumatology is a cool field. It's not all cardiology and GI. <laughs> um, there's a lot we can do, and you are going to be seeing these patients. These diseases affect all the organ systems. Please recognize it. Please understand that they are at high risk of inflammation. Please understand that if we can get our hands on them, we can make them we can try to make them better with substantial improvement. And as a final picture here, this is the déjeuner de Canotier, which is the breakfast of the boatman. And this was still when he had um, good use of his hands. Thank you.